Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Attic. In today's video, I'll be going back in time a little bit and reviewing the July 2023 JW Broadcasting episode, which was hosted by Governing Body Helper William Malenfant. Now, to be clear, the, re the reason why this rebuttal is a little bit late is because I was a bit blindsided by the organisation, by the Jehovah's Witness organisation. Typically, during convention season, the organisation won't release full JW broadcasting episodes in July and August. Instead, they'll maybe revisit a Gilead graduation or something like that. It's a little bit unusual for them to release JW broadcasting episodes in July and August. So I hadn't originally planned to do this rebuttal, but I very much believe in continuity in keeping the rebuttals coming for each and every JW broadcasting episode, even if it means adding more work for me and Tibor. So I have gone through the JW Broadcasting episode for July and selected some interesting clips. So without further ado, let's roll the first clip. When we accept the truth and make a personal dedication to God, in a general sense, we are sanctified or set apart from the world because we no longer fit into its mold. People view us differently because our values have changed. We live by the standards of Bible truth, and doing so honors Jehovah God, gives our life meaning, and brings us great happiness. With those thoughts in mind, how should we feel about the sayings of God and the Bible truths that we have learned? We feel the way the psalmist did, at Psalm 119.140, he said to Jehovah God, Your saying is thoroughly refined, which means that it's clean and pure. And then he said, And your servant loves it. Isn't that how we feel about the truth? We love it. It would be wonderful if everyone would respond to the truth of God's word and love it. However, the sad fact is that the majority of the world rejects it. There are many people who do not believe that truth is attainable. Some ancient philosophers made the teaching of doubts virtually their life's work. Human philosophy is built on pride of intellect and a warped pleasure of endless speculation that leaves Jehovah God, the Creator, completely out of the picture. By removing God, philosophers wander in a maze of ideas and theories that fascinate the mind and inflate the ego, but never arrive at the truth. Isn't that interesting? So there we have William Malenfant, governing body helper, Blasting philosophy as a total waste of time, something that is ego-driven, something that amounts to just endless speculation that leaves God entirely out of the picture. I found this really interesting, and don't get me wrong, I'm not massively into philosophy myself. I mean, I am a little bit conversant in it, but what philosophy I am conversant in, I don't find to massively enrich my life. And whenever I've tried picking up books on philosophy when going to the bookstore or whatever, even books that seem to have been written a little bit for the layperson, when I glance at the, at the pages, I just immediately start to mentally zone out. I'm just not built, I guess for philosophical thinking. But what I will note, which William Malenfant seems to be completely ignorant of, is that there are philosophical arguments both for and against God. So what he's really doing here is shooting himself in the foot or shooting the organisation in the foot 
by just issuing this blanket condemnation of philosophy, even though philosophy is used by Christian apologists routinely. There are any number of them on YouTube who will use such things as the Kalam cosmological argument, for example, to argue for the existence of a god or a creator. I just find personally all of the arguments for God that are presented by philosophers as ultimately inconsequential because even if, philosophically speaking, with all of these kind of mental gymnastics, you can talk a God into existence or you can argue for an intelligent beginning of the universe, that doesn't get you to Yahweh. <laughs> that doesn't get you, frankly, to any kind of theist God who is interested in what's going on on our planet and who intervenes in Earth's affairs. And I guess that's ultimately why I will always find philosophy a little bit unfulfilling. In other words, I would be more interested in philosophy if it were genuinely challenging my atheism or my scepticism. But because it fails to do that, I don't really care about it that much. Again, I try to be as conversant as I can. But I'm not sure that William Malenfant is doing himself or the organisation any favours by just, again, issuing a blanket condemnation which ultimately encourages Jehovah's Witnesses as a religion or as a people following a religion to stay in total ignorance, to stay uneducated. Doesn't that suit the organisation perfectly for Jehovah's Witnesses not to know even the arguments for or against God from a philosophical point of view. And again, you can find arguments going both ways. It's very much a battlefield <laughs> if you dip into this at all. But apart from all that, I found these opening words from William Malenfant fascinating. We live by the standards of Bible truth, and doing so honors Jehovah God, gives our life meaning, and brings us great happiness. Your life will have meaning, and you will be happy if you follow the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses, which, according to William Malenfant, are based on the Bible. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree with you there, William Malenfant. In fact, I've already done so in a video titled 10 Jehovah's Witness Teachings That Are Unbiblical. Thumbnail here if Tibor is gracious. I probably could have found more, <laughs> but I wanted to keep it to around about the hour mark. And yes, when you actually dig down, you can find many teachings that in some cases are central to the belief system of Jehovah's Witnesses, or greatly impact on the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses that have no basis in Scripture, or where the basis in Scripture is tenuous at best, or verses can be cited either for or against. A great example is that of shunning. Here's another thumbnail to a video where I find 14 Bible verses that are against shunning as practiced by Jehovah's Witnesses. And isn't shunning a great example of how Jehovah's Witness beliefs don't lead to happiness? Because not only does shunning cause misery and trauma for the people who are being shunned, it also causes, I would argue, misery and trauma for the ones who are doing the shunning, who are being forced to eject their humanity, their compassion, their love, their instinctive adoration of their loved ones, in some cases their children, they're being asked to dehumanize themselves and use human relationships as a weapon 
to control somebody. Essentially emotionally blackmail someone into returning to a religion that in many cases they have stopped believing in. So I disagree that the Jehovah's Witness organization is number one, biblical, number two, makes people happy, number three, gives people meaning. I mean, this is just an outright insult to everybody <laughs> on the planet who isn't a Jehovah's Witness, William Malenfant, essentially pointing at such ones and saying, your lives are meaningless. <laughs> Unless you believe as I believe, what meaning does your life have? So uh, thank you, I guess, William Malenfant, for being so upfront about all this. And I especially love where he says, How should we feel about the sayings of God and the Bible truths that we have learned. Isn't that how we feel about the truth? We love it. So yes, thank you for telling people how they should feel. <laughs> this is an area in which we all need help, I'm sure, figuring out how on earth we're supposed to feel about things. I, for one, really appreciate being told how I should feel about things and whether or not I should love things. And so thank you, William Malenfant, on behalf of the governing body or on behalf of the Jehovah's Witness organization for telling us all how to feel. <laughs> There's nothing culty going on here, folks. We're just being told how we should feel and we're being told that we should all absolutely love the truth as interpreted by Jehovah's Witnesses. If truth were not attainable, why would Jesus Christ say, as recorded at John 8, 31 and 32, If you remain in my word, you are really my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are we not experiencing the freedom that Jesus spoke of? And why would the Apostle Paul write at 1 Timothy 2, 4, that God's will is that all sorts of people should be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of truth. Why does the word truth occur over a hundred times in the Christian Greek scriptures? Oh, thank you, William, for that fantastic example of circular reasoning. So <laughs> if circular reasoning is a new expression to you, if you don't know what it is, just play that clip back a few times. And I can't personally think of a better example. So the circular reasoning here is, we know truth is attainable because it says so in the Bible. We can trust the Bible because it's true. <laughs> you can just go round and round and round. We can trust that Spider-Man is true because look, here's a comic that talks about Spider-Man as though he's true. <laughs> it's just astonishing, isn't it? The complete vacuum of intelligence, of academic clout in this infantilizing nonsense that's spewing from the mouth of not just any governing body helper. We're talking here about William Malenfant. This guy's been around the block a bit. You know, if his voice sounds familiar to you, it's probably because you were raised as a Jehovah's Witness like me and you heard his voice on the convention drama tapes or on previous DVDs that were produced by the organisation where he was narrating. He's been at the top or near the top of the organisation for quite some time now. He's been around the block and... Yet this is the level of intellectual rigor that we can expect from the faithful slave, from Jehovah's organization, a video in which people are told that truth is attainable because it says in the Bible that truth is attainable. True worshipers will worship the Father with spirit and truth. For indeed, the Father is looking for ones like these to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those worshipping Him must worship with spirit and truth. 
Jesus was talking about being guided in our worship by God's Holy Spirit, and that we do not need the use of temples, images, or other physical objects in true worship. Whoa, hold on there, William Malenfant. What did you just say? We do not need the use of temples, images, or other physical objects in true worship. Are we even talking about the same religion at this point? <laughs> I mean, he's losing me. He, he's, I mean, he's already lost me, I guess, from when he first started opening his mouth and telling me how I should feel about Jehovah's Witnesses, telling me I should love Jehovah's Witness teachings, telling me that I should ignore philosophers and expecting me to be impressed with his circular reasoning. He lost me a long time back already in this sermon in the July 2023 JW broadcasting episode. But this surely has got to be a joke. This surely has got to be just him seeing how far he can push things. Of course, this is an organization that isn't purely about worshipping God in spirit and truth, that believes very much in how things look and in physical objects, physical buildings, physical designs, physical logos, physical literature. It has a raft of rules on dress and grooming, on governing people's physical appearance and encourages Jehovah's Witnesses to jump to conclusions based on how people physically look, including whether men have facial hair, including whether teenagers wear the wrong type of jeans, including whether pants are too tight or not, and yet William Malenfant has got the gall to suggest that for Jehovah's Witnesses, everything is spiritual. Everything is about the Holy Spirit and worshipping God in spirit and truth. I'm sorry, the hypocrisy here is astounding. Read with me 3 John, verse 4, where it says, No greater joy do I have than this, that I should hear that my children go on walking in the truth. Isn't that how parents feel about their children who are serving Jehovah faithfully? Absolutely. Absolutely. For someone who's never had children, William Malenfant, you're awfully sure of yourself. However, not all young ones raised in a believing household have stuck with the truth. The same is true about many with whom we've studied the Bible. Is their situation hopeless? No, not at all. There's still time for them to act and show Jehovah that they love Him and that they love the truth. The end of this system is fast approaching. It is going to happen, and soon. We encourage such ones to give serious thought to their relationship with Jehovah God, because he genuinely loves them and wants them to have life. We pray that such ones take whatever steps are necessary to return to Jehovah before it's too late. It's a scriptural fact that people need to love the truth in order to be saved. This is the point that the Apostle Paul makes at 2 Thessalonians 2.10, where it reads in part, that people will perish because they did not accept the love of the truth in order that they might be saved. Our prayer is that honest-hearted people everywhere will respond to Jehovah's invitation to draw close to Him and love the truth. Aw, thanks for that prayer, William Malenfant. <laughs> So we've just been watching Governing Body Helper William Malenfant presenting the July 2023 JW Broadcasting episode. He's very keen on honest-hearted ones developing a love for Jehovah or becoming Jehovah's Witnesses before it's too late, before they get slaughtered 
at Armageddon. As I've pointed out repeatedly, whenever they use this phrase, honest hearted ones, this is effectively gaslighting. They are trying to convince people that only honest hearted ones would consider becoming Jehovah's Witnesses, meaning that if you disagree with them, if you disagree with the Jehovah's Witness leadership, it must be because you're not honest. It must be because you're a bit of a trickster. You enjoy lying. You enjoy deceiving. That's why the truth, as taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, doesn't appeal to you. And what sort of truth is William Malenfant offering in just this brief clip? Well, he's nailed down a date for the apocalypse. The end of this system is fast approaching. It is going to happen, and soon. Wow. Thanks for being so specific there, William Malenfant. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know that it's going to happen soon. That really helps us to formulate in our minds a bit more specifically when Armageddon's going to come. It's not like Jehovah's Witnesses have been saying this for decades, is it? <laughs> It's not like the, the literature has been saying exactly this for 140 years and counting, however long it is. It's a doomsday, apocalyptic cult. I'm just going to say it. Occasionally I will use the C word. And they want people to be convinced that the world is ending and the world is ending soon. There's just one small problem. The world refuses to end. Armageddon refuses to come. And so it's just this perpetual merry-go-round of expecting the end to be coming any moment. And William Malenfant, by the way, as someone who's a bit long in the tooth, as someone who's been around the blocks again as a higher up in the organization, he should understand very well the folly of this doomsday ideology, this continually keeping people in expectation of an Armageddon that's never coming. He is of the generation that was warning people about 1975. That's how long he's been around. So he's seen all of this before. He has literally been telling people for decades that Armageddon is coming soon. And he has the audacity to do it again in the July JW Broadcasting episode, in addition to dishing out scriptural facts. It's a scriptural fact that people need to love the truth in order to be saved. Is it now? <laughs> Thank you for that scriptural fact, William Malenfant. People need to love the truth. It's not like love is something that is purely subjective, that you either feel or you don't, where you get a choice regarding what your personal feelings are. You need to love the truth, the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses, if you want to be saved, if you want to survive Armageddon if you want to not be slaughtered. This world is heading for an abrupt end at the Battle of Armageddon. To survive that battle, we must have knowledge of Jehovah God and live in harmony with His Word, which includes the teachings of Jesus Christ. Earthwide, we are proclaiming the good news that God's kingdom has been established in the heavens. That proclamation is the foretold witness to all the nations that soon the accomplished end of this world system will come. No, no, not the end of our planet, because another basic truth is that the earth remains forever, as stated at Ecclesiastes 1.4. These are absolute truths that we preach, and we love them. Oh, he loves his absolute truths. Does, does William Malenfant bless him? So, yes, what do I even need to add to this? Um, again, thank you for just putting it plainly. I've commented before about how 
in the minds of some Jehovah's Witnesses, they create this alternate version of the religion where it isn't quite so black and white, where it is a little bit more nuanced, where Armageddon comes, and you know what? God's just going to read people's hearts, a bit like scanning goods at a checkout. <laughs> Bip! He's just going to be able to see immediately when he's scanning you whether you've got a good heart or a wicked heart. And it's on that basis that the killing will be done. It's not purely about whether you're a Jehovah's Witness. It's not purely about whether you're baptised. It's about whether you have a good heart. And then William Malenfant comes along and says this. To survive that battle, we must have knowledge of Jehovah God and live in harmony with his word, which includes the teachings of Jesus Christ. I mean, I suppose it could be put more clearly if you really want, if you really want to be fastidious about this. But then it has been put more clearly in past Watchtower articles. I'm thinking specifically of one in the 2019 Watchtower. We'll put the caption on the screen where Jehovah's Witnesses are reminded that you need to be baptised. Only those who are baptised as Jehovah's Witnesses will survive Armageddon. That's what it says in that particular Watchtower article. So I guess he could have been a little bit more specific rather than making it purely about learning about Jehovah and the teachings of Jesus Christ. But we all know exactly what he means. He means being one of Jehovah's Witnesses, learning about Jehovah's Witnesses and following the teachings of Jesus as interpreted by Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the only way you're going to survive Armageddon. I wish more Jehovah's Witnesses would think about this and just quit this parroting a version of their religion that, though more palatable, simply doesn't exist. Young ones, we know your faith is tested every day. Your peers question your belief in God, look down on Bible teachings, and make fun of your lifestyle. For your faith to remain strong, it's not enough simply to believe what you've been taught. You need solid reasons for what you believe. That's why we're pleased to introduce a brand new video series just for you called Reasons for Faith. In each episode, young witnesses like you talk about why they have faith and how they keep it strong in a world that has little or no respect for God's Word. Why was it difficult to uphold God's moral standards at school? The environment at school often exposed me to immorality. For example, girls would wear short skirts. I received instant messages from people I had never met before. They would send me photos, a phone number, or invitations that I could have just simply accepted. So I could have easily committed sexual immorality. Sometimes I felt like I was missing out on something important. When I heard my classmates talking about what they were doing on their evenings and weekends, about drinking alcohol, and new drugs they were trying, or girls they had slept with, I started to become curious. What did you do to strengthen your faith? During family worship with my parents, we studied the example of Daniel, far from his family, among people that didn't serve Jehovah, he succeeded in remaining faithful, and I wanted to do the same. To strengthen my faith, I started reading the Bible. I had to take the metro to get to school, so every morning I took the opportunity to read a few verses. I thought about the verses I had read. By praying to Jehovah, having a kind of constant conversation with Him, Jehovah would put me in a little bubble. I started feeling comfortable inside, and I was no longer under the bad influence of others. And the fact I prayed more also made me feel closer to Jehovah. It was a bit like Psalm 63, 7, which describes how Jehovah shelters us under his immense wings. 
Well, that's exactly how I felt. Prayer allowed me to face any temptation. We've just been watching the first installment in a new series for young ones titled Reasons for Faith. I can only assume they have finally gotten rid of my teen life. They've put their fake YouTuber style series out of its misery <laughs> or put us out of our misery by getting rid of it. I can only assume this is the replacement because my teen life was just, well, it was just cringeworthy in the extreme. It was showing you, as the subjects were talking, stock footage of young people in various situations. It was trying to make young Jehovah's Witnesses sound authentic as though they weren't being coerced to give certain cookie cutter answers. I think with this new series, they're just learning from my teen life. I mean, I could be wrong. They might do my teen life in the future, but it seems they've learned their lesson a little bit and they're like, hmm, that didn't really work. <laughs> Let's just straight up do a series where young people talk to camera about their experiences growing up in the organisation and the challenges they faced. And they're obviously going to repeat what we expect them to repeat. They're going to say favourable things about the religion and its influence on them. The only thing is, that's not how the series has been presented. William Malenfant has made a pretty big claim about what we're supposed to see in this series. For your faith to remain strong, it's not enough simply to believe what you've been taught. You need solid reasons for what you believe. So we've been promised solid reasons for belief in the Jehovah's Witness religion. And by the way, I agree with William Malenfant here. I agree that if you're going to take any religion seriously, it's not enough to simply believe. You need to convince yourself. You need to examine evidence and have evidence available proving that whereas all of the other religions are lies, are nonsense, yours just happens to be the one true religion because you have all of this evidence. There's just one small problem. There is no religion on the planet that has that kind of evidence. <laughs> so he's setting up the whole series for a monumental fail if he's suggesting that young people are going to come on camera and give us reasons for faith, solid reasons for being in the Jehovah's Witness religion. And straight out of the blocks, this is the sort of example we're being given. By praying to Jehovah, having a kind of constant conversation with him, Jehovah would put me in a little bubble. I started feeling comfortable inside, and I was no longer under the bad influence of others. That well describes what it's like to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, living in denial, <laughs> just praying constantly and erecting like a force field or a bubble around you or existing in the broader Jehovah's Witness bubble where everything on the outside is terrible and corrupt and people are out to get you, whereas everything on the inside is blissful and serene and everyone loves you and you don't want to even think about going outside of your bubble and going into danger. I relate to what he's saying as someone who has myself grown up in the Jehovah's Witness religion. There's just one small problem. That's not a solid reason for being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Why do you believe that Jehovah's standards are beneficial? I closely observe the young ones in the world and I realize that they are suffering from the standards they followed. I closely stick to the moral standards that Jehovah has given me. I'm aware that they are there for my benefit, because with the experience I've had in school, I've observed the painful consequences that my classmates have suffered. 
Some got into trouble with the law or got sick. They've had health problems caused by their lifestyle. Oh no, not problems caused by their lifestyle. These worldly people, they're having health problems because they're not Jehovah's Witnesses. Thankfully, Jehovah's Witnesses don't have any health problems due to their beliefs. It's not like they would, for example, die rather than accept a blood transfusion. A girl in school did something immoral with a boy, and it started circulating around the school. Because of that, the girl didn't come to school anymore, and she started having suicidal thoughts. I understood that Jehovah protects us with his principles, his standards. And if I had compromised even once with his standards, I would have regretted it sooner or later. And for me, there's nothing worse than regret. I'm 100% sure that Jehovah gave me these moral principles for my own good, so that I could be morally clean. He also helps me to be positive. For example, he helped me to see my classmates as potential disciples, and we were able to have conversations about the Bible together. I am really convinced that Jehovah's standards are good for me. Being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is the best life possible. So there we have it, the first installment from the new series Reasons for Faith, which again I'm guessing is replacing my teen life. Again, my issue here is where are the reasons? <laughs> Where's the evidence that the Jehovah's Witness religion is conspicuous in being God's one and only true religion? That's what we were promised. And all we've heard here is, frankly, fallacious reasoning. A couple of young Jehovah's Witnesses reflecting on their time in school and saying silly things like, oh, all of the worldly children around me were suffering due to not having the morals that I have. So they're assuming, based on their biased viewpoint, as a child raised in a Jehovah's Witness family, they're just walking past children and classmates in the school corridor and making judgments about their classmates, assuming that they're suffering, assuming that their lives are worse off because they don't share the same moral values. Moral values, moral principles that were given by Jehovah. I'm 100% sure that Jehovah gave me these moral principles for my own good, so that I could be morally clean. So you're morally clean, and everyone who isn't one of Jehovah's Witnesses is what? Morally dirty? <laughs> They're suffering. They are deficient. They are an abomination in some way. In the mind of this young man who's convinced himself to live in this bubble where everything outside is debauched and twisted and out to hurt him. I would argue that far from being morally superior, the Jehovah's Witness religion is morally negligent, is morally deficient. For example, a typical Jehovah's Witness, such as the two young people who have been on this particular episode of Reasons for Faith, these two people will believe in shunning. They will believe that it is morally acceptable, morally advantageous for families to be broken apart on ideological grounds so that someone can be emotionally blackmailed into returning to a religious organisation. Those are the morals that they're talking about here. Or what about the morals that call for child abuse to be covered up? What about those morals? What about the advice in the publications that elders need to contact the branch and let the branch decide whether abuse should be reported to the authorities? What about those morals? I would dare to suggest that my morals are way superior. I mean, it's not hard 
to be superior, is it? All you need to do is have basic humanity, basic compassion, basic sensitivity to the horrors of abuse and the urgent need to bring sexual predators to justice. That's all you really need to have superior morals to the two young people who've been dragged in front of the camera here. Young people who are parroting the ideology of an organisation that prides itself in breaking up families and covering up abuse. Real faith has the power to improve people's lives in ways they couldn't have imagined before learning the truth. Take our brother Jason Worlds. He learned that what the world offers pales in comparison to what Jehovah freely gives us. News overnight, Steelers linebacker Jason Worlds is walking away from the NFL in the prime of his NFL career. Worlds is, or has been, with the Steelers for five seasons and started in all 16 games. He's just walking away from tens of millions of dollars. What is he going to do with the rest of his life? No clue, but it better be worth it. My name is Jason Worlds, and I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. My mom is a beautiful woman. It was in her early 20s that she was introduced to the witnesses and she took a study and six months later, she was baptized. And so my mom put the truth before us growing up, but I didn't see the true value of what it is that I had. I, I didn't know how true the truth was. It's vital that you set spiritual goals. If you don't, the reality is that someone is going to set a goal for you. And I think that's what, what was true in my case. I started playing American football my freshman year of high school. One of my coaches sat me down and said, you can potentially go to college on a full scholarship. I did everything to succeed at football. And so the, the dedication, um, it escalates. I studied the Bible for several years, but by the time that I started to make progress in my study, I was being courted by the NFL. I was whole sold <laughs> um, to, to football. And so I pursued my professional career. When I was drafted, it was what I had been working towards for so many years. That first year, it was chaotic, but then my second year, I got to a point in my life where everything was unstable. I, I felt that the things that I was pursuing were fruitless. I, I just felt, I felt hollow inside, right? I felt like if you shook me, I would rattle. <laughs> and I saw those who had more money, more success, and they weren't happy. That was one of the motivating factors for me to say, you know what, there has to be something more. There has to be, because I'm at the precipice of what I've always wanted. And only thing that I can see is more angst, more headache, more strife. This is how pervasive the Jehovah's Witness indoctrination can be. Thank you, Jason Worlds, for demonstrating that any amount of exposure to Jehovah's Witness propaganda as a young person can take root and lead to you making terrible decisions in the future. And I say terrible decisions, I'm sure he will feel perfectly content with the decisions he's made. He will, he, in fact, he is saying that he's happier and more content now. Of course, he's going to say that, but what has he really gained? He's not really gained anything. He's given up control over his life. He has allowed an organization to decide for him what career he can have and what decisions he should make, even in such intimate areas as who he chooses to have as a partner, what he does in his sex life, what his entertainment should be, what his dress and grooming should be. That's the upgrade he has supposedly attained, that we should all be gushing about. I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. I feel sorry for the guy, and I can't help but wonder whether it might have been some kind of mental health crisis that tipped the balance. That first year, it was chaotic, but then my second year, I got to a point in my life where everything was unstable. I, I felt that the things that I was pursuing 
were fruitless. I, I just felt, I felt hollow inside, right? I felt like if you shook me, I would rattle. <laughs> he felt hollow. He felt like everything in his life was unstable. And it was coming from that mindset that he decided to pick up where he'd left off with pursuing the religious organization into which he'd been indoctrinated by his mother. That was the starting point for him jettisoning his career as an NFL athlete. Oh, I'm feeling hollow. I'm feeling like everything is in turmoil. I need there to be more to life than having a career or enjoying life <laughs> or just finding your own purpose. I guess the meaning of life must be in this religion I was raised in. There was nothing there that was going to bring lasting happiness. And I think that is what motivated me to want to see what's in this Bible. And so I reached out and I picked up a study with a local brother there in Pittsburgh. For a time, I felt like, man, I can do, I can do both of these. <laughs> I got my craft here and I'm enjoying it. And then I have Jehovah. As a defender in football, there are certain things that you, you dream of. One game, I had one of those opportunities, but I didn't put everything into it the way that I always dreamed of myself doing. I let up. The person that I was on the inside was changing. That night, I sat thinking, and you're not in an environment that's conducive to you continuing to grow as a spiritual person. You might need to make some changes. And that night is when I realized that, hey, you know what? Yeah, I don't, I don't need this. Why are you here? What are you doing? The reality is that I loved playing football. I enjoyed it, but it didn't bring true happiness. I retired at a time where I was going to take the next step with my career. And so the, the offers that were on the table were tens of millions of dollars, and that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so once I let them know that, then the offers increased. But that wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to make the truth my own and get into the full-time ministry. I was baptized September 13th, 2015. That day was so special because Jehovah completely welcomed me into his spiritual family. I've become a better friend. I've become a better brother. I've become a better son. <laughs> There's nothing but wins when you serve Jehovah. The joy, the happiness that I receive now and why I just rejoice to be out in the ministry is because you have an opportunity to actually affect change in someone's life and make them a better person and give them purpose and have them have this same warm relationship with Jehovah that you have. It's unparalleled. That's the fact. <laughs> the more that we center our lives around Jehovah, the happy will be. That's where my happiness comes from. As Brother World said, the more we center our life on Jehovah, the happier we will be. Yes, it's all about happiness, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? It's not about Jehovah's sovereignty. It's not about obedience. It's not about knowing your place and spreading the kingdom message per se. It's about doing what makes you happy <laughs> when it suits the organization for it to be about pleasure and happiness. It's about pleasure and happiness. Oh, I wish they'd get their message in order. But yes, this was Jason World sharing his story. And again, I just can't help but feel like something is off. I can't help but wonder what story we would hear if this gentleman were to ever wake up from his cult indoctrination. Who knows, maybe I'll get to interview him on the channel someday. But this very much sounds like someone who had reached burnout point, 
someone who felt as though the walls were closing in, who was going through some kind of crisis and started just thrashing about looking for meaning in life where there was none. Again, you're always going to think differently if you are of a religious persuasion. I happen to be atheist and I happen to think that you get whatever meaning you want from life. If there's something that you feel passionately about, you should pursue it. And quite frankly, just enjoying life in and of itself is a reason to live. It's better to do that than to be just doing stuff that makes you miserable to the point where you're so depressed that you end up ending it all. And what's interesting is here we have an organization that brags about having the happiest people, thumbnail here to a recent sushi if Tibor is gracious, and yet even in the organization's own video propaganda, you'll get stories of where Jehovah's Witnesses, despite their beliefs and despite their involvement in the preaching work, reached breaking point, reached a stage of utter despair, anxiety, depression. And anyone who spent any time as a Jehovah's Witness, like on the ground in the congregations, will be able to think of examples of people who were attending all of the meetings out in the preaching work, and they were still on antidepressants. They were still struggling with their mental health. So with all the best will in the world for Jason Worlds, I think he is misrepresenting and misselling the Jehovah's Witness organization to an entire generation of young people who will perhaps view him as a role model. He is portraying the Jehovah's Witness ideology as some panacea that's just going to inject you with instant happiness. When anyone who's actually spent time as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and been exposed to the abusive, toxic nature of the organization will give you a very different story. It's natural for some of us to feel a measure of anxiety conversing with someone we don't know well. But if we've prepared well ahead of time, we can now take a deep breath, focus on the value of the message, and smile. This can help us to relax. And often our smile is contagious. I'm Laura. The last time I was here, we talked about who controls the world. Yes, I remember. You even showed me it is the devil, right? Yeah, that's right. If you have a few minutes, I wanted to answer the question that I left with you last time. Why does God allow suffering? Did you notice how she didn't put the householder on the spot? She reminded the woman of her name and also the topic they had discussed on the initial call. Now, she can continue her discussion right where she left Why off. Why does God allow suffering? I'm kind of busy right now, but do you mind if I ask you a question? Now, this is the moment we sometimes fear most. We plan to continue the discussion, but the householder has an unexpected question. So, here's one approach that works well if we would like to have more time to prepare a response. I'd like to know if the Bible says anything about gay marriage. You know, that's a really good question. Well, in a way, it does talk about that. But would it be okay with you if I answered this other question first? Then I can do some research and find the best possible scriptures to be able to answer your question next time that I come. Does that sound okay? Sure, that's fine. Did you see how our sister just gave an honest response? Um, was it that honest though? <laughs> was it honest or was it evasive? I would suggest that the question was dodged. The sister, the... Jehovah's Witness in this scenario had an answer in her mind, knew exactly what the organization's position on gay marriage is, 
but chose to kick the question into the long grass, chose to buy some time to go away and try to find the most persuasive answer for someone who hasn't yet been indoctrinated into thinking that gay people are an abomination. That's what we've just seen. So this is Iron Sharpens Iron. It's a regular feature nowadays on JW Broadcasting. The circuit overseer who's presenting this month's show is Marcelo Coelho. Apologies if I've mispronounced. And he's doing the same old thing of training Jehovah's Witnesses on how to do the preaching work with some sisters, with some female Jehovah's Witnesses, giving sample presentations, or in this case, a demonstration of how to deal with a return visit. And what we can plainly see is, well, first of all, it's not very realistic, is it? The person is fawning all over the Jehovah's Witnesses and offering very little pushback, really. It's not a very realistic depiction of what life is really like when you're on the doorstep. But Jehovah's Witnesses want everything to be controlled. They want to be able to be able to prepare a conversation in advance. They need things to go their way. And the purpose of this particular video is to help Jehovah's Witnesses control the conversation in the context of calling back on someone that they've already visited. And the way they are supposed to deal with an awkward question is essentially, as we've seen, to kick it into the long grass, to ask for a bit more time to do research on the best scriptures that they can possibly find to support a position that they already know about, but justifiably don't feel comfortable being open and transparent about when challenged. And here's our last tip. Leave them wanting more. Make sure to keep our visit brief and leave them wanting more. What approach can we use? Set up a question? for the next visit. Hmm, that's interesting. So this thought leads us to another question. If God allows suffering to happen, when will he put an end to it? That's a good question. But since I mentioned I would be brief, could I maybe come back Saturday? Then I can answer this question and also the other one you asked. Yeah, that would be great. There it is. Three easy steps that can help us be more comfortable and also help us make successful return visits. Be warm and friendly, continue our discussion, and leave them wanting more. Thank you, Marcelo, for those hot tips on how to conduct a return visit if you're in the business of indoctrinating people into becoming Jehovah's Witnesses. So, yes, leave them wanting more seems to be the, the gist of what we've just heard and this is done by asking a question, leaving the conversation on a cliffhanger <laughs> where you pose a thought-provoking question and promise to answer it on your return, which in this case is in just a few days. Now, interestingly, I don't know whether it's still the same, but when I was a Jehovah's Witness, we were expected to make weekly return visits. And if you think about it, that is not a great deal of time between conversations. So imagine you are the householder here and you just indulge these people who've called at you unannounced, un unexpected. You perhaps realise that they're Jehovah's Witnesses and you decide to indulge your curiosity by, you know, giving them a conversation and then they're back at your home in seven days or less. And here an arrangement is made to call back on Saturday. Again, it's not very realistic, is it? I can remember in the rare instances where I did call exactly a week 
after the initial visit, I felt a little bit like I was stalking the person. I felt I felt like I was kind of harassing them. For me, a comfortable period between return visits was more like two weeks. Granted, I was never truly successful. This is all about successful return visits in that I never thankfully managed to convert someone to becoming a Jehovah's Witness after encountering them in the preaching work. But nonetheless, this is how pushy Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to be. And this is frankly how strategic they are when it comes to scheming their way into turning you into one of them. Jehovah's people speak hundreds of languages and come from almost every imaginable culture and background. Yet we enjoy a peace that is viewed by many as a modern-day miracle. That's what this month's music video is all about. It's called, When All Hearts Sing as One. never cease fighting for peace men cannot find the answers through all these stormy seas and empty philosophies jehovah provides a hope for mankind Among Jehovah's Witnesses, unity isn't just an ideal, it's a reality. A reality that is enforced under threat of shunning. If we're being honest here, William Malenfant. So we've just been watching the music video from the July JW Broadcasting episode. The theme of this music video, When All Hearts Sing As One, it was a typically cringy video, wasn't it? For me, the most chilling part was this. Sorrow is gone and death is undone Every knee will bend To Jehovah our King Every knee will bend To Jehovah our King <laughs> I mean, that's the sort of chilling rhetoric you would expect from any despot, any warlord, any dictator. Every knee will bend to your king. But for some reason, put it in a cheesy cult televangelist propaganda music video and suddenly it's, it's well, it fits in perfectly, doesn't it? And you also have there the footage of people popping back into existence when death is undone. I've discussed the resurrection teaching on this channel before. It's actually 
quite an absurd teaching which insists that everybody who has ever died up to the point of Armageddon will be resurrected so long as they haven't sinned against the spirit, so long as they're not effectively apostates. You could be an absolute monster from Earth's history. You could be Vlad the Impaler, you could be Genghis Khan, you could be Osama bin Laden. You're, you're still entitled to a second chance in the paradise after Armageddon. But this is, in all seriousness, the teaching that keeps so many Jehovah's Witnesses locked in their indoctrination. This idea that if they stay faithful, they'll get to see their dead loved ones again. If you think about it, it's a sick game of using people's grief to control them, to make sure they never even think about straying from your religious organisation. And this twisted, perverse teaching, which preys upon people's vulnerabilities, is celebrated in this music video. Back in 2016, Cyclone Winston ravaged Fiji. At the time, it was the most powerful storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. In the small village of Nangandamu, most of the homes were virtually flattened, and our brothers and sisters lost almost everything they had. The only building that survived was the Kingdom Hall. But a village chief, aware of the witness's good reputation, granted them a block of land right around the Kingdom Hall to rebuild all their homes. Local brothers worked with disaster relief volunteers to build 14 new homes to house the entire congregation. So this was just an odd little story that's been included right at the end of the July JW broadcasting episode. They do these postcards, these video postcards from various parts of the world showing Jehovah's Witnesses preaching and worshipping in their congregations. In this particular episode, we've been visiting Fiji. And this story about Cyclone Winston really didn't sit well with me. We're talking about a cyclone that killed 44 people and caused $1.4 billion worth of damage. And rather than giving that information, rather than explaining just how deadly the storm was, and how much damage it did and how it impacted on people's lives. They're zeroing in on this feel-good story about the Kingdom Hall somehow surviving the storm, which will make Jehovah's Witnesses watching this think, oh, wow, there must have been some kind of protective force field erected by Jehovah and the angels around the Kingdom Hall. There must be something special about the Kingdom Hall because that's where Jehovah asks his people to gather. They spin this yarn about how a village chief, after the storm, allowed them to effectively set up a commune around the Kingdom Hall so that Jehovah's Witnesses watching will both think Kingdom Halls are somehow special, they're magical, they are the place to flee to during a storm. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we all lived in a commune around our kingdom hall? For me, that's the message of this story. And that being the case, at least from my perspective, this is a remarkably tone-deaf approach to take when covering natural disasters such as Cyclone Winston. If Tibor is gracious, you'll see a thumbnail to a video I made about whether Jehovah controls the weather. It's a very old video, but it raises, at least from my point of view, an important question. If we're going to talk about natural disasters, if we're going to talk about the wreckage and the damage that's caused when the weather is at its worst... How do we account for the organization claiming that, for example, Jehovah manipulated the weather when 
the Silver Sword 2013 revision of the New World Translation was being printed so that more copies could be printed. That's actually a claim that was made at the 2013 annual meeting by Jeffrey Jackson. And what about the claims that have been made in past JW Broadcasting episodes, one in particular where it was claimed that a typhoon that, again, was deadly, that actually killed people, was somehow used by Jehovah to make sand available for the refurbishment of a kingdom hall. For me, Jehovah's Witnesses can't have it both ways. They can't both claim that God manipulates the weather in their favour or to the favour of the organisation and make propaganda pieces like this where they pretend to care about the damage that gets done. And in the context of what happened in the Philippines with Typhoon Haiyan, to suggest that Kingdom Halls, or even hint at the possibility that Kingdom Halls are a place to flee to when there is a natural disaster because they might be somehow protected, is just shockingly negligent because when Jehovah's Witnesses in the Philippines pursued this strategy and sheltered in their kingdom halls, in at least one instance, which I actually cover in another video, what happened in the Philippines, this is another older video, I'm thinking specifically of a congregation in Tacloban in the Philippines, 22 Jehovah's Witnesses died believing that they could defy the recommendations of the authorities, which were to flee the area because there was a storm surge coming. They believed it would be more advantageous to shelter in the Kingdom Hall and it cost them their lives. Anyway, those were my thoughts on the July 2023 JW Broadcasting episode. I hope you found them helpful. I'll get straight back, if you don't mind, to preparing my remaining two rebuttals for this year's exercise patience convention season. Stay tuned to the Lloyd Evans channel to see those. But for now, thank you so much for watching.